Psalm 142 and verse 4 says, Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. It may be hard for some of us to relate to that statement. We're sitting here in an auditorium with a lot of people we know. We've greeted them. We've shared already joy and comfort and hope. But I have no doubt, I have no doubt, in an audience of this size, there are some people who say, that's me. And, and even, in the, even in the midst of people who appear to have it together and feel comfortable and hopeful and faith-filled, it just intensifies the loneliness and the isolation that some people feel. But even if you're not one of those people, I hope in the next few days to challenge you about this subject we're going to be looking at, the subject of fellowship. You'll see a word behind me that is clearly Greek. I'm, I want to say this up front. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar. I only know a little Greek, and he runs Stefano's Restaurant that has some of the best Greek food I've ever eaten. But that's, that's about the extent of my Greek. I, I can know a word and I can learn how to pronounce it. So don't get put off by that word. But I do want to tell you why I'm going to use that word a lot this week. And I'll say this for those who may be in the audience and might know Greek. I am going to abuse that word this week. I'm going to use it in context that a Greek <clears throat> scholar would say, Give me a gun. I'm going to shoot him or me, but one of us is going. But I'm going to do that for a reason. I'm going to do that because I don't think most of us, most of us, really understand all the depths of this word we call fellowship. We, we use that word so freely that we have come to restrict and limit when we hear that word, what it really means. So we hear fellowship and we automatically think in certain terms. For some people, religiously, when you mention the word fellowship, like Pavlov's dogs, they start salivating. Fellowship. Oh, yeah, that's eating. That's eating together. And there are some who think when they hear the word fellowship, oh, yeah, basketball games, softball league, bowling group. Some people think fellowship is what we're experiencing right here, right now. Just a sharing together in a public worship setting. But this word is so much richer, so much deeper, so much more valuable than all that. And it's going to be my goal this week to challenge your thinking about it. And at the same time, to broaden your understanding of this word as it is used in the Bible. So part of the reason I'm, I'm using this word koinonia is we're not as familiar with it. So when I use the word, hopefully you'll stop and go, wait, wait, I don't know that word. I don't know the meaning of that word. So I'm willing to hear what you have to say. As opposed to locking in automatically on, oh yeah, I know what fellowship is. I want you, first of all, to notice the company fellowship or koinonia keeps. If you've got your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there. I'm going to read this passage for you, and I'm going to make a couple of observations about it. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. <clears throat> they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All right, now I, I, I want to I try to emphasize for you just how rich 
this concept of koinonia is. If I were to ask people in this audience individually, how important is the apostles' doctrine to your religious group here? I think every person here would say, well, Ralph, the apostles' doctrine, absolutely vital to our welfare. We wouldn't be the people of God without the apostles' doctrine. We emphasize it all the time. We teach it. We start out teaching little children. They memorize the names of the apostles. And then we learn from their books all the time. Our preachers and teachers are all the time teaching from the apostles' doctrine, the teachings the apostles gave us. We would not be God's people without the apostles' doctrine. And I'd say, yeah, that's right, amen. I would agree with that. Well, what about this? How important in your fellowship here is prayer? I know we just had one, and we'll probably have others, but in terms of your relationship to God and to each other, how important is prayer to this church? And you'd say, Ralph, I'm going to tell you, I don't know your church. I don't know all of your practices. But if you're like a lot of other churches, you might say, you know, sometimes, Ralph, we devote whole services just to prayer. Just to praying. And we pray in our classes, and we encourage our members to pray at home. And our elders encourage the members to pray, and sometimes they'll lead if prayers as the shepherds of this congregation, oh, prayer is vital. We would not be God's people without prayer. It is essential, and it is very intentional for us. It's not an accidental thing or coincidental thing. It happens because we know how important it is to us. Well, what about the breaking of bread? Now, the Bible uses breaking of bread in two senses. There's one in which they broke bread from house to house, and that's a common phrase that sometimes we even use. We'll say things like, hey, let's get together and break bread on Tuesday. You want to meet somewhere? And we, we may do that. We might meet together and do that very thing. That's not the breaking of bread that's talked about here in Acts chapter 2, though. I think contextually it makes much more sense to know that the breaking of bread here is the Lord's Supper. So let's talk about that. How important is the Lord's Supper to y'all? You'd say, goodness, Ralph, do you know we meet every week to take the Lord's Supper? I mean, we focus on it. We dedicate specific time to it. It is a very intentional part of our worship. In fact, it is vital. If we weren't involved in the Lord's Supper every week, we believe we wouldn't be the people of God. And I would agree with you about that. All right. Now, we've looked at three things in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that I think every person here would say, these are vital elements and they are things that we push and cultivate and deepen so that we can have the proper relationship with God and with each other. And then we've got this one, fellowship. And I'm, I'm not in your mind, and I haven't talked to a lot of you, but I've talked to a lot of people about this subject, and I think a lot of people would say fellowship is kind of a byproduct of all the other things we've been doing. It just happens. It happens deeper in real friendly churches, but it just is something we kind of enjoy. And sometimes it's better than other times, but it's what we get because we're members of the body of Christ together. And I, I would suggest to you that's not the case. This, because of the company in which it is found, is just as intentional, just as vital to the body of Christ as those other things. Now, we, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to try not to talk a lot about the COVID pandemic. 
I think we've all been through it. A lot of us were sick with it, and a lot of us are sick of it. But it did something to us. It did two things, and they're very opposite. For some people, it brought them to a conclusion and a realization that for them, worshiping at home or on my own is all I need. I don't know of a church, and if I learn differently here, you'll be the first. I don't know of a church that didn't lose members in the pandemic and and didn't lose them to other churches. They just lost them altogether. People who just said, I'm staying home. I I don't need the church. I read a man's statement one time who said recently, who said about this, why aren't you coming back to church? He said, you know what? I kind of realized that I wasn't getting anything out of the church that I wasn't getting from my Rotary Club. I don't need it. Now, that's one extreme. There are people, and and there may be some people even this morning who are watching from a distance, who are just kind of plugged in this morning. Maybe they've been surfing on the Internet, and they happened to stop here and said, man, that guy's ugly. I wonder what he has to say. There are people who may never come back to church because they don't see a need for anything more than instruction in their lives. But the other extreme is the exact opposite. There are some of us who realized coming out of the COVID bunkers, my goodness, we need each other. Man, we need each other. I mean, we we just need to be together, and you're reveling in that and and singing together like we're doing this morning. So much better than sitting on the couch, singing in a timid voice by yourself along with a screen. Two extremes brought on by this. But I want to tell you, the first century church understood the importance, yea, the vitality, the absolute essentiality of koinonia. Koinonia. And, and note, note one more thing about it before we leave this passage. I want you to see what it says they did with it. Verse 42 says, they were continually devoting themselves to these things continually devoting themselves to these things. Now, I'm not gonna, I don't want to stay here because we have a lot to cover. But I think most churches would say, we, we, do, we continually devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. I mean, it, it's in our curriculum. It's in our sermons. We intentionally work on that. And, and we continually devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. That's an every week thing for us. And we spend a lot of time and effort to make sure it's valuable to the saints. And prayer? Yeah. Prayer. I mean, we pray all the time. And that is something we continually devote ourselves to. Look at the heightened nature of that phrase. It doesn't just say they were devoted to those things. It says they were continually devoted to those things. Devoted. What do you think of when you think of the word devoted? Devoted means I I think about it all the time. A guy says to a girl, honey, I'm devoted to you. I I mean, I am utterly devoted to you. If he wants to borrow a phrase from Olivia Newton-John, I'm hopelessly devoted to you. And then she says, oh, I'd love to hear you say that. Are you coming over tonight? He goes, I don't think so. It looks like rain. Kind of undid the devotion there, didn't he? But it doesn't just say they were devoted. No. It says they were continually devoted. I mean, they couldn't quit thinking about it. Now, we understand that about those three. We understand that about apostles' teaching or doctrine and prayer in the Lord's Supper. But have you thought about that as regards fellowship? So in the modern world, In the modern religious world, fellowship is things like coffee houses and 
fellowship halls. And what takes place in fellowship halls often is so remote from the spiritual applications that this word finds itself in the company of that it's sad. And for some of us, fellowship is a little deeper than that. It's more than sharing food. And it is more than chatting about the weekend. And it's more than gathering a few people at your house to play a game or making social calls. We need to enjoy fellowship together more. And a lot of us, when we hear those words, enjoy fellowship together, we think in terms of socialization. But it is deeper than that. And I'm going to say some of us are thinking spiritually. You may say, no, Ralph, I'm beyond that. I get that. But I don't know that we've made the deep dive that we're going to make in these lessons this week. Because fellowship, listen, is more than Bible study. And it is more than praying together. It is richer and more encompassing than even those things. So come with me. Look at this word. Let me give you the translation of this word. This word is translated throughout your New Testament with the word participation. Koinonia. See, you, again, now you, we don't no, normally think of fellowship as participation. But that's the way the word koinonia, which is the word fellowship, is translated. It's also translated by the word partnership. And it's translated by the word sharing. When you see the word sharing in your New Testament, that's our word, koinonia. When you see partnership, and you won't see it a lot, but the couple of times I'm going to point out to you where you do see it, it really does say a lot about what fellowship or koinonia is all about. And then, of course, it is translated with the word fellowship. So I'm going to show you this word over and over again because it is just peppered throughout the New Testament in the hopes that you start seeing it as something more than just we're a family and kind of enjoy one another's company. And that's what fellowship is about. It is about that. But it's about a lot more than that. So for this morning, by way of introduction, let me just consider the word with you in two aspects. First of all, koinonia means a common purpose. It is the idea of sharing in something. One of the ideas of this word is sharing in a joint venture or a joint participation. It might be this. It might be like this. You bowl, I bowl. Hey, why don't we get a bowling team up? You like seafood? I love seafood. Let's go eat seafood together. See, I find you're in it, I'm in it, we're in it together. Does that make sense? Okay, folks, let me pause for a moment. I live for feedback. I, as a speaker, need to know whether I'm getting through or not. And I will warn you, if I'm sure I'm not getting through, I'm going right back to the beginning and start all over again. <laughs> so I can read this. I can read this. I can read this. I cannot read this. I don't know what you're thinking. I don't know whether I'm connecting or not. Now, I don't want you all like bobblehead dolls. I say, did you get that? And everybody, do, 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 three times we're done. I don't mean that. But I will be asking you for affirmation. Did that make sense to you? Did you get that? Was that clear to you? And if one side of the room doesn't nod, at least in some way or another, I'm going to just walk over there and preach a sermon again, let the others go to sleep, and wake them up when we get back to the point we were where I asked the question. I like something, you like something. Hey, let's share in it together. And the Bible uses the word that way. So in Acts chapter 2, there were disciples that came from all over the world. They had come from all the nations to Jerusalem. 
And they got there, and then they were continually devoting themselves to fellowship. What, what were they sharing in? Hey, we found Christ. We found the apostles' teaching. We have a new avenue of prayer in Jesus our Lord. The breaking of bread makes sense to us. I like that. You like that. I do that. You do that. Let's do that together. That's one of the concepts of fellowship because they were related to Christ. They were related to each other. And we experienced some of that this morning. I did when I came in the doors. I met people I didn't know at all. And I'm going to guarantee you, some of those people, as friendly as they were by nature, would not have greeted a total stranger on the street like they greeted me. They greeted me that way because they knew I was sharing in spiritual life in Christ. And even though they didn't know who I was, it was, you're in that? We're in that too. Welcome. Welcome. Let's share in that together. So that word denotes a kind of a partnership, an agreement to work together. I want to go back to a passage just real quick, but I think it's fascinating because it really emphasizes what we're talking about. I'm in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And I'm looking at verse 10. Now this is where Jesus is starting to call the disciples to himself. Man, that sounds good. Love to hear those pages turn. It sounds like locusts lifting off the earth. You know, I really, I get excited about that. If you don't have a Bible, just rustle a songbook or something, you know. <laughs> it just gets me excited. So Luke chapter 5 verse 10 says this. It said, well, in verse 9, amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which, which they had taken. That's Simon Peter. And it says, and also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. That word partners, partners with Simon, that's our word, koinonia. They were in koinonia with Simon. Now, I know you, you, we wouldn't tend to use the word fellowship that way because it's so secular, But you see, koinonia wasn't born in a church building. It was a pretty common idea or concept in the secular world. So here's how that worked. James and John said to Peter, you got a boat? Yeah, we got nets. I don't know that we're real good at them because most of the time when you hear us talking about nets, we're mending them. But hey, we got nets, you got a boat, let's get together. We got boats. My, our dad has boats. James and John's father had a fishing enterprise. And they got together. How? How? Well, Peter said, I love fishing. They said, we love fishing. Peter says, I know the Sea of Galilee. We know the Sea of Galilee. I got boats. We got boats. Hey, let's put it together. And they put their hands out and said, here you go, partner. Yeah, they used the southern version of that. Partner. My father-in-law always referred to people by that word, partner. I'd go into a hardware store with him, and he'd be walking toward the counter. He'd go, hey, partner, let me ask you something. He wasn't from Texas, <clears throat> but he loved that word. And the idea was, a, I think, for him, a way of just kind of connecting with people. We're partners. Guy on the other side of the counter is going to give him what he needs to go home and fix what he needs to fix. We're partners. Put her there. We call each other all kinds of names. We call each other brothers and brethren and disciples and Christians. Partner's a really good word. Because what it conveys is we're sharing in something together. And I don't know, but I don't know about you, but every time I hear the word partner, I always think of shaking hands, just kind of putting the hands together there. Here's my hand, here's your hand. Partners, partners. It's a good biblical term for us. It says a lot about what we do together. We're partners in the songs we sang, in the prayers that we offered, in the word that we're sharing in. Partners. And so that same word, koinonia, partners, 
is used in a spiritual sense almost the exact same way that it's used there in the book of Philemon. When the apostle Paul wrote this to Philemon, in verse 17 he said, If then you regard me a partner, if you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. Partner. Paul used that word for Philemon. Hey, we're partners. Let's share together in this. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 5, the Apostle Paul talks to the Philippian brethren and says, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. That's our word koinonia. In view of your koinonia, your partnership with me, your sharing with me. We're going to talk about how they did that in one of the other lessons. But this was how they shared. Partnerships are formed to attain a common objective. That's what they're meant to do. Obtain a common objective. I want to do this, you want to do that, let's do that together. I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to say this to people who are, who are away. And look, I want to say this up front, I don't want to keep repeating it. I understand some people are not here who wish they were here. And they're watching from a distance and they would give anything for that not to be the case. God bless you. I'm not talking to you today about these things. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to change your course of action at all. You are doing the best you can. God knows that. These people know that. Keep doing what you're doing. But there are some people probably watching this, either now or later, and some of the ones that are watching later are watching later because they were doing other things right now. And they're thinking, I'm getting all I need. And what I'm telling you is you don't have partnership. You have not invested partnership and participation with the saints. That is vital. Again, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, continually devoting yourself to that. This is what sharing in is all about. And then there's a second idea. The common possession. It's sharing with somebody what you have. That's a different concept. That's a different idea than sharing in. Sharing in is, you like that? I like that. Let's do it together. Sharing with is, you want that? I got that. I lived in Mississippi for five years. I loved preaching in Mississippi because I learned wonderful expressions from the people there. I remember one time going to a guy in the congregation. I said, hey, I, I'm in need of a chain. Uh, I need a chain. Do you have one? Here's what he said. Hey, as long as I got a biscuit, you got half. <laughs> That's a great expression. That's a great expression. You know what that says? Koinonia. You need it, I got it, you got it. It's sharing with others. And I'm going to tell you something. It's one thing to say we're sharing in. It's another thing to say we're sharing with. One is, I'm doing it, you're doing it, let's do it together. The other is, I'm particularly responsive to you and your needs because I have what you need. And that creates an incredibly deep bond for us together. Sharing with others. So communion, though we sometimes limit it to the Lord's Supper when we use that word, communion is the idea of sharing spiritual things with others. It's sharing teaching. It's sharing God's love. It's sharing His encouragement, God's encouragement. It is looking out for others and saying, hey, I think you have a need. I've got the solution or I have help, or I know where we can get help for you. It's an awareness of each other and what we need. So this aspect of koinonia, I'm going to say this and hope you understand it. 
this aspect of koinonia would not allow someone sitting in this auditorium moved to tears to weep alone. This aspect of koinonia would not let that happen. Now, it may very well be that that passage we began with in Psalms, look to the right, nobody cares for me, no one cares for my soul. It may be that there's somebody sitting in this auditorium this morning who says, that's me, that is me. And we may not know it, and I, I, I'm sorry if we don't know it. And I, I would just say, if you're in that situation, you need to make that obvious. But one thing is for sure. God's people wouldn't let somebody weep alone. I have seen it happen, and I know I'm going to say things this week. I have, I have heard wonderful things about you as a congregation of God's people. I heard great things from so many sources, from some of your former members who are worshiping with us, and from students who were here and came and worshiped with us while in Tampa at college. And I, I know there are wonderful things. And I'm probably going to say some things. I'm going to say, you might consider doing this. You'll say, Ralph, we've been doing that for decades. And that's wonderful. It is not, I'm not presuming you don't know anything about what I'm talking about. Nobody's ever done these things. But I have been in congregations where I've, in a, at an invitation, somebody's come down front and they're weeping. I mean, they're crying. Their hearts are broken. And I've watched members just sit there and let that happen. All alone. All alone. Folks, I'm telling you, an application of this passage as I'm talking about it, as I'm trying to show you from the scriptures, wouldn't let that happen. Somebody would get up and go down there and put an arm around that person. The shepherds would be crawling over the pews to get down there to be with that person. Family members would be there. This is sharing with others. It is taking responsibility for others. What united these people in the first century was Christ's teaching and his salvation of them. And that's what they shared in common. That's what they koinonia In every aspect of that, they shared together with each other. Now, as we close, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions. Is, is that what you would say this church shares most in common? Or is it most of us are about in the same socioeconomic status? Um, we like Texas ball clubs and teams. We like Texas. We like barbecue. Well, that's a given. We live in the same geographical area. That's what unites us most here. We're in the same political party or group or we have similar ideas about this or that. Is that what unites this church? And I'm not saying some of those things won't be true. But what should unite any given congregation at any given time in any place is this. You love Jesus Christ with all your heart? So do I. Hey, we got something in common. Let's be partners. And because we're partners... If you ever have a need, I'm going to apply the love of Christ to you, and I'm going to meet that need. And when I have a need, I'm coming to you, because you are Christ in the flesh for me. Now, I want you to just think what an incredible experience it would be if that's the way every person in here thought about every other person. I'm going to give you one last thought here, and then we're done. Sometimes, and I, I, I hesitate to say this on one hand, when I go someplace and I haven't been here before, because sure as a world, somebody will come up and say, you know, our preacher 
just last week, or my teacher in class just last week gave that very thing that you're talking about not being true. But we, I learned, I grew up learning, there are three works of the church, three works of the church. One is edification of its members, the other is evangelism of the lost, and the third is benevolence. I'm going to suggest something to you. I don't see or think that the Bible teaches that benevolence was a work of the church in that same way that evangelism and edification was. I'll tell you what benevolence was. Benevolence was the natural response of Christians who loved the Lord with all their heart and loved his people because they represented it. It wasn't a work like evangelism is. Churches will say, churches will say, we're going we're gonna to really push evangelism this year. We're going to go all out in that area and we're going to get in the community. Or they'll say, we're pushing a real educational program and we're going to make sure all our Bible classes are on board and across the board we're doing this and that. All this is done for that reason. But I don't know any church that says, this year we're focusing on benevolence. We're just going to try to give away a lot of money and a lot of our resources to people who need it. But they give away a lot of resources to people who need it. Why? Not because it's a work, because we're a family. And you don't let somebody at your table starve. You don't do that. We're family. And it is a natural outgrowth. I shouldn't have to be told it's a work. It is the natural outflow of my life because I'm a child of God, and you're a child of God, and we're in this together. Hey, that's where we're starting. That's where we're going to go with our lessons this week. I hope that that challenges you at least in this point. Hey, I am fine if you're saying, eh, I'm kind of skeptical, Ralph. I need to be shown. I love that. I'm ready to take that on. Or it may be you're saying, never thought about it before. I got I to gotta give that a lot of thought. Good, good. But some of you are saying, this is what I needed. I mean, th this, is, this is where I am, and I need to know how to do it. Let's explore all this together. And let's see what God has to say to us about this incredible subject of koinonia. Thank you for listening so well this morning.